Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Yogananda's mission in the world, about the line of gurus that came with him, about Ananda, but I'm really not here to talk to you in a sectarian way, even though the subject of what I'm talking about is the path that I myself have followed for all of my adult life and is the obviously what we teach and the methods that we teach. But the, the power and the importance of it is really not personal to anybody who really follows it. It's more about where the planet is right now, what it is that we're all facing, whatever countries we're in, and how, this, how the spiritual path in general, and how a, an expression of the spiritual path like this one, um, how it all fits in and makes everything come together. So um, I was just about to say, before I actually speak, I was going to ask Duti to sing a song for us, but she's taken herself off the podium. This is a song, Swami Kriyananda, in addition to the many books that you see outside, has written a great number of songs. And all of them, both in the words and in the feeling of them, convey something of what it feels like to be a devotee and what the spiritual search is. So I asked her to sing one that's a particular favorite of mine. And um, what do we actually call it? The Divine Roman? God's Call, well, oh, it's God's Call Within. That's what it is. The words are very simple, and she has a lovely voice to share it with well, us. Maybe I'll, I'll just say a, a couple of words about this. It's actually um, the first movement of a piano sonata that Swami Kriyananda wrote called The Divine Romance. And um, many years after he wrote that piano sonata, which is beautiful in itself, he put the first movement, he put these words to the first movement. It's normally done with three voices. So um, you're missing a couple of voices, but it's better than nothing. And while I, I just want to say a word about the music, because those of you who are here um, this morning, and also if you came to the program, um, the music that we do at Ananda has kind of two prongs. There's the chanting, and that's um, specifically, um, we use that in kirtan and before meditation to help us open our hearts and become in a very devotional space. It helps for meditation, and Yogananda said that chanting is half the battle. So that's, that's pretty powerful words right there. And then there's a whole n uh, another segment of music that we do, which is the songs. And um, they're very, Swami's written over 400 pieces of music, including string quartets and an oratorio and songs that are um, like bhajans, but also songs that are more Western in their style and songs that are somewhat like folk songs. Many of them have four or five parts in vocal parts. And so uh, you saw the choir. Uh, we did three of the songs at the event on Sunday. And so you can tell that that's kind of different than the chants that, that we're doing. So I just wanted to explain that. This is uh, more of a song than a chant. trying to um, get the right note because normally I do it with a, um, a group. So just hold one second. Um, I had it figured out earlier, but I've... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sweet song. 
songs of sadness, of quenchless yearning for the light, for my love, your true home. Long your heart has played the dance along you. of the treasures left behind you deep in your soul long you've plumbed the dark for answers long you've begged from beggars empty hands gifts of life they too were seeking gifts none personal favorites. I take every opportunity to hear it sung. Oops, excuse me. Um, I first came to India in 1987. It was, uh, it, it was partly a business proposition. It was a spiritual business proposition. Um, I lived at that time at the ashram of Ananda in California, which is called Ananda Village, which was the first and is still the largest ashram. It's a, it's a huge thousand acre village, complete village that has been there since 1969. Um, I met and married my husband there and we were, um, we had a, a, a very creative idea, which is that very few of the devotees in America of Yogananda um, had ever been to India at that time. Travel wasn't quite as easy. So we thought we would bring a group of Americans to India and we would take them through the places where Yogananda lived. He was born in Calcutta. We would go to Varanasi, of course. That's where um, significant incidences in his life described. And so my husband, who had been to India once, came a second time and toured around and planned out this trip. Then he came back to America, and I and two of our friends led a tour to a country we'd never been to. Um, he knew what was happening. We had professionals helping us, and, and I knew a lot about our spiritual path, so I was able to pretend. And actually, it was a really glorious experience all the way around. It was the first time I had been to this country. 
or had been to any part of what people call the developing world, a non-Western country, whatever words you want to use, where you see great population, where you see people crowded in under more difficult circumstances. And those of you who traveled in America know that there's a contrast between our countries. Of course, everything is coming much closer together. That was 1987. That was quite a long time ago. I'd heard about the concept of overpopulation, but in California, it just doesn't, it doesn't have the same ring it has when you're on the Howrah Bridge at uh, uh, rush hour, you know, and where, where it means that everybody is right next to each other for a really long period of time. When uh, friends of ours from Calcutta came to America, and we went to see the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco at rush hour, and all there were were cars. And he looked at us so puzzled, and he said, where are all the people? And we said, well, all the people are inside the cars. And it was just totally bewildering to him that there wasn't hordes of them walking back and forth. But perceiving just a very different reality, which I felt quite at home with. I think my samskars are more Indian than American. I have always had trouble when I see this face in the mirror, and I finally realized because it's too white, it's too light. It doesn't look like my natural face. I don't know whether I'm African or Indian, but I'm not this in my heart. Now I've grown used to it. You know, 65 years, you recognize it. But the point being, I was perfectly comfortable. It wasn't any of that kind of aversion. But I, I, I saw the complexity of the society and of the social situation and of the overpopulation. And, but all the solutions to all of that are right within our grasp. You know, the, the wealth of one country could be shared with another. The technology of one country could be shared with another. The every, the, it's all there. Uh, everybody knows that we could change this world. And everybody knows that we're not going to. Because we don't have the consciousness to do it. That the problem is really not scarce resources, too much garbage, whatever it might be. The problem is that we don't have the right consciousness. We're not united enough with our brothers and sisters around the world. We're not self-sacrificing enough. We're not in tune with any divine plan that would cause us to apply ourselves in such a way to change all of this. <coughs> I'm not, I, I started out in life like many young people do, more politically active and so on like that. I quickly became disillusioned about the possibility of change that way, which led me onto the spiritual path very young. I understood that it would never be a perfect world out there, that the only place where the perfection was possible was within myself. And that is the dividing line, really, I think, in, on the whole planet. There are people who believe that the external world is the first world to relate to, and then there's people who believe that the internal world is the first world to relate to. People do all sorts of different things with those realizations, but it, that's the dividing line. It's the only dividing line I've ever really been able to find between who becomes interested in the spiritual path and who doesn't. Those who have figured out that this is an internal reality, and if I can shift my internal reality, everything else follows. So sitting there, and I, I have a visual memory, so I remember sitting on the tour bus that we were traveling around, looking out the window at crowds of people, when that very strong thought came, the way to change the world is to change consciousness. I mean, I could campaign for clean water, and I can buy a cow for a villager, and I can do all kinds of different things, which we all do those things. There's no reason not to do those things. But if we really want to see anything change, it's going to have to be a change of consciousness. We're just going to have to feel completely differently about ourselves and our world. I have dedicated my life from a very young age to precisely that, for precisely that reason. I, I mentioned to you, like many young people, I was very politically active. I did one year of college. I was saying to some of you this morning, I went to a pre prestigious university, which I mentioned, just so that you know what kind of background I had. I went to Stanford for one year. I actually got my picture on the front of the paper because the Vietnam War was going on at that time, and I marched into some building with a pillow under my arm and helped. I mean, actually, I marched out of the building with the pillow under my arm because we did a sit-in and we took over the school building and we protested the war. And 
I just did all of those things. But there was a, an absolute sense of futility that we could make as much noise as we wanted to and take over as many college buildings as we did and that there was some other force that was directing life. And I just quickly backed up until I found the idea of consciousness, which I um, am grateful to Swami Vivekananda because it was a book of his that was put into my hand by a friend that I really felt was the first true book that had ever been handed to me. I had learned lots of facts about all kinds of things, but it was the first time anybody had handed me anything that I knew was really true. And it was about how to change consciousness. The first book was Raja Yoga, Karma Yoga. There's a, a quartet, I believe, that taken from his lectures. But I followed then three years in America of very serious study. Um, I had a, a, a job that didn't really mean much to me. I, it was just a way to go to work and come home again. It, it didn't really matter. And I started just reading as much as I could read about the spiritual path. And first I read philosophy. I was very much of a purist. I started, when you start with Vivekananda, there's not too much else place to go from there. So I read all about Ramakrishna and all of Vivekananda's writings in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna and all of those books. My, my first um, spiritual experience is very dear to my heart. And then I became interested and how do I become different? Because it's one thing to be able to sit around with your friends, which I did. We talked and we were so impressed with our ideas and we had so much fun analyzing the books. But every morning I got up and I was just the same person. And every day I went to work and I did my work and then I came home and I never saw a place where I was going to become different. And I knew it was possible, but I didn't know how. Simultaneously, I was running another thread underneath all of that, which, like many people of refined consciousness, I wanted to help. You know, you, you see so much misery around you, whether it's the misery of poverty or the misery of wealth, it really doesn't matter. I know when Mother Teresa of Calcutta came to America, she remarked that the poverty of America was much worse than the poverty of India because the poverty of America was the unhappiness of lonely people. My uh, very good friend who was our tour guide for many years, he's a, a, a extremely westernized Indian. He could live anywhere in the world easily. And he said to me, oh, I would never live in America. He, he takes American tourists over India, has been doing it for 25 years. I would never live in America. He said, no matter how much you people have, you're never satisfied. <laughs> And I thought, mm, that's the truth, isn't it? You know, it's just, there's poverty of many kinds. And I was always amazed as a young person by how unhappy people were. I just was bewildered by how unhappy they were. They were well-to-do and so on, but there was no deep satisfaction. And karmically, I was of a more cheerful disposition, but I felt that my happiness was luck, and I didn't want it to just be luck. But, so I started reading Lives of Saints, and I read everything that I could find. There was a metaphysical bookstore nearby, as it happens now, at that store is owned by Ananda, but at the time it was a private store. And I just took, I just went to the shelf, I took off Eastern and Western and every kind of saint I could find. I read about them all. Then I went to the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, I read the epics, I had so much fun. You know, an American girl in 1967, just doing all of this. And I wanted to help. I think it was the two motivations. I wanted to be happy and I wanted to help. And I was learning how to be happy, but I still didn't know how to help. And then Swami, I met Swami Kriyananda, and I mentioned this on Sunday night. In 1969 at Stanford University, he came to speak. And he was an extraordinary combination, as he still is, of world citizen. Um, he was American. His passport is American, but he grew up in Europe, so he never really had exactly the American vibration, is what I would say. He speaks eight different languages, and he's home, at home wherever he goes. But still, he spoke un, unaccented English, 
and he had experiences that were similar to my own. But when he walked into the room, he had this, he was transmitting his own happiness. And it reached me, just instantly it reached me, and I'm sure many of you who were sitting there on Sunday night, he just was transmitting it. He had it for himself, and he had learned how to transmit it. And the very thing that I longed to have happen had no idea how to do it and wasn't even certain it was possible. I, I can only say it walked into the room. And it just walked into the room, and as soon as I saw it, I knew that was exactly what I wanted. I wanted to become like him, and I wanted to do what he was doing for the same reasons that he does. Somebody asked Swami Kriyananda on a radio program not too long ago in Los Angeles. He was giving a radio interview. And you know, he's an older man, closer to the end of his life. This woman said to him, are you happy? It's a question that people ask each other. Almost no one will say, oh no, I'm not happy. My life was a total wreck. You know, almost everyone feels obligated to defend their position. I'm pretty happy. I'm sort of happy. You know, no matter how bleak they look, they'll still just assert it. No one wants to admit it, usually. But Swamiji gave a much more sophisticated answer. He said, it is the nature of true happiness to want to make everybody in the world as happy as you are. And that really separates out between just saying I'm happy and really having a bliss state within you. In fact, the question that's so often asked, why did God create this world in the first place? Swamiji's answer to it is, it's the nature of bliss to want to share itself. Now that's a beautiful answer in itself, but Swami Kriyananda has this wonderful way of not just giving you the last idea, he gives you all the reasoning that enabled him to get there so that you not only memorize ideas, but you learn how to think yourself so that when you're confronted with new situations, you, you also know how to think about it from a spiritual point of view. So he makes that statement about why God created the world, which how do I know? But then he says it so simply, he brings it right back to our life. If you go out this evening, and you go to a restaurant that you really enjoy that you've never been to, won't you call someone tomorrow and tell them? Or send them an email or send them a text from the restaurant? If you enjoy the program here or enjoy Swami Kriyananda, won't you tell your friends about it? Because as soon as we are happy about something, if we are really happy about it, the first thought we have is an expansive one. It's, it's completely connected. The desire to experience and the desire to share are completely connected when we're talking about real bliss. Not just pleasure, not just ease, but when we're talking about real bliss. So when Swami says, yes, because it's the nature of true happiness to want to make everyone as happy as I am. That's why at the age of 86, he's still, I mean, he can't walk on the stage by himself. He, he doesn't care. I mean, once, once his body is brought to wherever it needs to be, and he doesn't have to move it around anymore, as you could well see, the spirit is, is without any limitation. But then when it's time to stand up, he has to be helped off the stage. This is poignant for someone like me. He's like, he's of my spiritual father, and of course I knew him when he was a vigorous man, but it's, the sacrifice of the body is worth it for the, for the power of the spirit. But even at this age, he lives to make other people happy. Although he jokingly said the other day, he said, I've lived my whole life to make people happy, and now when people are around me, all they do is weep, is what he said. <laughs> he was, of course, making a joke, because so many people now respond to him with tears, but he knows why, because he responds himself with tears many times. But back to 1969, when Swami came in that room, and I saw, I saw what I was looking for, and my life direction was set in that moment, and I've never looked back, not ever. But then he started talking about not merely who he was, which, truthfully, he kept a lot more undercover in those days. I, it, that's the only way I can say it. He, kept, he, shielded, he shielded himself from casual gaze. You had to, have, you have to head sort of look under to know. 
But he started talking about what he was doing. He was building a community, he was building a retreat, he was going on tours, he was writing music, he was writing books. In other words, it's the nature of bliss to try to help others. And he didn't at that time, but later on as I became deeper in this teaching, I began to understand, you know, this Yogananda primarily is the one who's mostly known, and Babaji are the two that people know. Of course, Christ and Krishna are well known. But he's a disciple, a direct disciple of Paramhansa Yogananda, author of Autobiography of a Yogi. Many people already, in the few hours that I've been in this city, have talked to me. I read this book, I read it 20 years ago, I read it yesterday, I read it last week, and the power of it to transmit states of consciousness and to give us an idea of, of what might be possible, it, it can't be measured. It's so far beyond ordinary experience. Well, Swami Kriyananda, when he was 22 years old, that book had been published for two years. And he was in New York City, and he was drawn to that book, almost literally physically pushed by, a, by an invisible force. He bought the book, he recognized Yogananda as his guru. This was in 1948 in America. As Swami said on Sunday night, he thought yoga was a kind of yogurt. I mean, he just knew nothing. The word guru, chakra, karma, which now is really bantied about in all countries, totally unknown. So the, the magnitude of the call that came from that book, it's really hard to imagine how strong it was, because he just walked away from everything, having no idea where he was going, and went to Los Angeles, just went right to Yogananda. The first words he said were, I want to be your disciple. And 67 years later, that's the only life he's lived. And what happened when he gets to Yogananda, I mean, m my life with Kriyananda is like, you know, like this big. Um, Kriyananda's life with Yogananda is as, as different as it can possibly be. But we're all the same in our themes. And Swami had the same desire. He wanted to know truth, and he wanted to share that truth with others. And so what he found when he found Yogananda, whom we call Master, when he found Master, what he found was one who could tell him the truth and then also asked of him right from the beginning that this is not meant for you alone. It's the nature of bliss to want to share itself. And that Yogananda, I mean, some Masters come and they don't have a particular mission. They just live. Ananda Ma, one of India's great woman saints, you know, she just simply, she was very feminine in a sense in her mission, in her consciousness she was beyond male and female. I never, I never met her. My husband met her. I, I came to India too late to meet her. But she never started an organization. She never wrote a book. She was illiterate. She signed her name with an X. She just basically sat from place to place, went from place to place and just radiated divine consciousness, transformed thousands of people's lives with that power. Yogananda, by contrast, he had this very definite reality that he was going to do, that this is a shifting time from Kali Yuga into Dwapara Yuga. On Sunday night, Swami Kriyananda talked about that. I understand. I was only introduced to these things by Yogananda, but I understand in India, there is some question about whether the Kali Yuga age is going to last longer, whether Dwapara has started now. Um, Yogananda corrected what he said was a misunderstanding of when the transition comes that came in during the Dark Age when they didn't understand. But Yogananda's mission is based on the premise that the whole world is shifting now into a higher level of awareness. Really, it doesn't take much to see that. Look at what's happening on the planet. You know, this, this amalgamation of cultures, this dissolution of space and time, the way we can just go from country to country. I got on a plane in San Francisco and in almost no time at all I was here. And we haven't quite learned to transport ourselves with light vibrations like they do in science fiction, but you can still get on a plane. I can, I can call my husband in California and we're just talking like this. I can open the computer and he can see me and I can see him as if all that space didn't make any difference at all. I mean, that's the smallest way you can see it. I mean, look at your country. It's just like in the 30 years that I've been coming here, 
It's just becoming a completely different place. And we can lament that. So as the way Swamiji puts it, he said, it's necessary for India to modernize and to become wealthy again, to take its place, its rightful place in the, in the world. You know, it, it can't remain an isolated reality. These are things I'm not qualified to comment on, but we lose and we gain at the same time. But whether we like it or not, this is what's happening. I was tra traveling in the, I have a, an intense aversion to modern so-called music. You know, just that really cacophonous, terrible sound. I was traveling in Costa Rica, and I was in the hotel, and I said to my husband, I think they're having a public execution down by the swimming pool. They were actually playing some music, the sound of which was, sounded to me like people being tortured and screaming like this. <laughs> and they were being tortured and screaming in English, <laughs> you know? And it, it was, I, I thought to myself, I always like to take a negative thought and turn it positive if I can. I was just embarrassed to be an American, absolutely embarrassed to have been the source of that horrible noise that was coming out into the swimming pool and torturing everybody else there. But then I thought to myself, well, at the present time, what's being passed around the world, and I see it on the street here, is Pizza Hut and uh, KFC and Taco Bell, you know, all of these things, just not the highest vibrations, not terrible, but not the highest, McDonald's. I was visiting in Venice, Italy, a very old city. We were staying way on the inside. We could find our hotel, because you went to the McDonald's and turned right, then you went to the Burger King and turned left, and then you were at our hotel. We were deep in the heart of old Venice, Italy, you know, walking along the canals, and we find our way by American fast food restaurants. However, what's happening is the channels of global communication are opening. And even though a whole lot of what's passing through that channel now is pure garbage, when our consciousness collectively begins to get higher, we are united in this spirit. And that unity of spirit is not something that's going to happen for everybody at the same time. I'll give you another story. I was in New Delhi. We were, uh, have, have a friend there who actually has a high position in the international airport in New Delhi. He's responsible for the safety of the planes. And we were there just at the time, I'm, I pay so little attention to current events. It was one of the wars that America was involved in recently when it was bombing somebody. And it had just more or less started um, right when we were there. And this man was saying that he was in an airplane working with the safety of the airplane at some particular altitude. And the American planes were taking off from somewhere, going out with bombs, bombing, and then going back. So he was watching this, this war, more or less, happen below him while he was doing his work. I mean, this is all 30 or 40,000 feet in the air, whatever it is, most peculiar description. I'm sitting in this room with 15 people and we're from six different nations. None of the nations that were at war with each other. But we all just look at each other like, what are people thinking? How can they imagine that anything that anybody wants is going to come from this kind of action? And then someone said, which I loved, he said, we are a unique nation and we are the nation of self-realization. And all of our passports really are not our true passports. Because those of us who understand, or even aspire to understand, the power and presence of God within us, we are one consciousness. And it doesn't matter where we are, even what language we speak, that's what we're here for. And this precisely was what Paramahansa Yogananda incarnated to create. He, t he spoke. Of, of specific realities. He, called, he spoke of world brotherhood colonies, which are intentional communities where a new kind of spirituality can be lived, where all of these divisions of the past, that's what Dwapara Yuga is about. Kali Yuga is the material age. And when you think about matter, everything is separate. 
you know, the chair is separate from the rug, and the rug is separate from the floor, and you're separate from me, and my country is separate from someone else's country. Everything is separated, because on the material plane, things don't seem to, to blend. But now, even though we still live in this world, we have this deep new understanding. Einstein himself is the one who brought it out first. He said, matter is not really matter at all. It's just a vibration of energy. Of course, the rishis of India said that a long time ago, but now it's coming out into the scientific West, too. Almost everyone can quote that, but very few of us really understand what the implications of that are. That this world is simply not what it seems. The scientific side from the West is coming here. The, the spiritual side from the East is coming here, and this truth is, is being manifest. And Paramhansa Yogananda was born precisely to be the divine instrument, to be, to be the avatar of that reality. And even his whole life was just perfectly designed for that. He spoke a great deal about the, the, the um, divine destiny of the United States and of India. That India has always been the keeper of the flame of spiritual understanding, and America has that practical wisdom. And that's why, I mean, there's this enormous interchange. I live in Silicon Valley. Where I live now in California, in America, there is no dominant culture. It's actually very interesting. One third of the population of our area is, is Asian of some kind. Many, many, many. I'm sure almost all of you have relatives who live in Silicon Valley. I would be surprised if, if there's one person in this room who doesn't know someone who lives there. But anyway, but it's, it's uh, East, East Asian of some kind or another, mostly, mostly Indian, but also from China and some from Vietnam. One third is Spanish speaking immigrants who've come up from South America and Central America and Mexico. And then one third is everybody else. <laughs> you know, the group like me who used to be considered the area. You walk, you walk around there and there's, there's no dominant language. I mean, in some areas the signs are in Russian. And it's just so strange. And, and Spanish has become a second language in our country. That's very unusual. But it's just like we're all there together. It's the, it's the beginning of this. But Master talked about the fact that, that the spirituality of India would meet the practicality of the West, and then finally we would have what we need to go forward. And that's precisely you know, the world that I've been living in. And what Yogananda brought both to America and now what is being brought back to India is not Hinduism. And it's not really the tradition that all of you grew up in. I grew up, in, I grew up Jewish. But the country I live in is Christian, you know, Catholic, Christian, evangelical, all those different. Jesus is the dominant. The actual understanding of who Jesus was and what he taught is lost in the churches. They really have no idea who he really is. And they just teach a version of it. And to a certain extent, the way Swami describes it, and he's, I'm not knowledgeable to speak. I know it in a very superficial way. But Hinduism is also ancient. Swami describes it as a huge overgrown tree in need of pruning, where it's not the truths are more vibrant, but the methods of expressing it. My, I'll quote one of my Indian friends. He said, it's the only religion in the world where you have to hire someone to practice it for you, is how he put it. When he talked about having to hire a pujari to come in and do the right ritual, <laughs> I thought, well, that sounds apt to me, you know? And you don't actually understand necessarily what you're doing, and you do it out of tradition, and it, it, there's truth in it. It warms your heart. It pleases your family. But it's not necessarily, we're not necessarily holding the tools of shifting consciousness in our own hands. In the West, it's really no different. I'll use Catholicism as the most example because it's the epitome of it. The priest, you have to go to the priest. You have to be blessed. You have to confess to the priest. You have to be absolved by the priest. You have to believe in this particular church or else you're going to go to that particular hell or whatever it might be. You know, people who believe in Jesus can just make you crazy trying to, you know, tell you that unless you're exactly like them, I and mean, it's just, it's Kali Yuga is what it is, where everything is separate and it can only be this and it has to be that. It's just not where we are now. So Yogananda was born in India, in Calcutta, as you know. He's a Bengali. 
And, but at the, in, at the age of, in his early 20s, you know, in his mid-20s, after training with his guru here, he was sent to America. Babaji says, of course, we know this because we love this. Babaji says in Autobiography of a Yogi, I, pers I perceive potential saints in Europe and America waiting to be awakened. You know, we all sort of line up to try to be one of those potential saints. <laughs> And so for that reason, he sent Yogananda to America. But there was a much deeper reason why he sent him to America. America is a very interesting country. I didn't know any of this until I traveled. I was in my mid-30s. I didn't travel. I didn't have a passport until I got married. My husband had huge travel karma, and I got sucked right in be behind him. So since I married him, I've been all over the place. But the first time I left America, we went to uh, uh, Italy. That was the first country I remember being in. And Italy is not as old as India, that's for sure, but it's older than America. And we were in Florence, Italy, which is the land where Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and other great artists lived, you know, quite a little while ago. And all the Florentines thought it made them really special because Michelangelo lived in their city. And they would point to all the old things, and I was just absolutely flabbergasted. And I realized Americans have nothing. We have nothing behind us. I mean, we came to a wilderness. Um, what culture there was there, we immediately obliterated, which is nothing to be proud of. And everything that happens in America happens because we're looking forward and we're making it happen ourselves. That's why there's no class, there's no caste. There's just the work that you put out and the success of that. It, it leads to a certain immaturity, I think is the word that I want to use, but also this tremendous sense of freedom, just this tremendous sense of freedom. And Yogananda came deliberately to America because he wanted to establish a new understanding of the spiritual path, and he even jokingly put it this way. He says, in India they know how hard it is to realize God. The Americans don't know. <laughs> so I just talk to them about it and they say, sure, we can do that, you know, because <laughs> that's just how we feel about everything. Sure, we can do that. We just don't have this weight of tradition telling us how difficult it might be. Nor do we have the weight of all of that habit of looking backwards, because we don't have anything to look back to. Swami Kriyananda remarked how wonderful it is that computers are such a big thing in India because there's no way you can deal with a computer the way your grandfather dealt with a computer because he didn't have one, right? So the whole technological revolution is breaking the hypnosis of the past. And it's not that the past has nothing to offer us because especially your culture has a tremendous amount to offer. I mean, I bow at your feet. I, I, this is my culture, even though I, I didn't grow up here. This, this culture makes much more sense to me than any other. But nonetheless, the bondage of the past is there. So Yogananda came to America, to Los Angeles, California. California is a very open place. And he just started something new. Not new in the history of the world, but he put it very simply, a completely new expression. And that new expression is defined by Dwapara Yuga, which is spiritual life is in the hands of every individual. There's no priest. There's no ritual, there's no church that makes promises to you, there's no dogma, there's nobody you can hire to practice it for you. It's self-realization and it's in your hands. Now, of course, in the context of America, that was, yes, sure, that's where it ought to be. And then the other side of it is, it's completely practical. It's just absolutely grounded in, here is a technique, let me just give it to you, and in the the lineage of these masters, um, some people, uh, Babaji, whom you all well know, his disciple is Lahiri Mahashaya. Lahiri, these are you know, real personages. These are not gods and goddesses. This is sort of a painting, but it's from a photograph. He lived in the 1800s in the city of Varanasi, and he was a householder. He was a married man with children, but he was a fully realized master. But in, in the age of about 30, through the circumstances described in Autobiography of a Yogi, he found himself drawn to the Himalayas and drawn back to his guru, Babaji, where he received initiation into Kriya Yoga. And then he assumed 
that now that he'd come back to his guru after the separation of that lifetime, now that he received this initiation, I say this, this is how the story is told. When the saints and the masters tell a story, it's half the truth and half just a, a, an allegory so we can get the picture. But Lahiri assumed that he would just remain in the Himalayas. Isn't this the picture that, you know, you, at least in India, that's your picture of spirituality. You walk away from everything and you go off to the Himalayas. You must always live to be ready to be called to the Himalayas. Oh, as a young girl in America, I mean, I would read that. It was so exciting to me. When I first saw the Himalayas, it was all so exciting. And I would imagine being called to the Himalayas and living in the cave. It was just, you know, I'm mean, living in San Francisco, riding the bus to and from work. You know, just kind of a crazy world, but it was totally fun. So Lahiri just assumed that he would stay up in the mountains. And his guru said, no, you, you go back to your wife, to your children, to your job as a government accountant working for the, uh, Eng the English who were running the country at that time. And that's where, that's where you're going to practice your spirituality. And that's how you're going to initiate others. And then Babaji said to him, as it's told in autobiography, give this sacred initiation only to those who are willing to renounce everything in the search for God. So as the story is told, Lahiri Mahashaya says to Babaji, in essence, I don't think I'll be doing a lot of initiations then. <laughs> but then what he said is, there are so many people who could benefit from this. He said, can't we relax the standards a little bit and just give it to everyone who sincerely wants to know God? And Babaji says, the divine has spoken through you. And so we all owe Lahiri a great debt of gratitude. But what was really happening there, because this is a line of masters, and the way in autobiography it's described, and I, you know, these are things I say with complete faith um, because I have come to believe them over many years. Um, uh, I have driven Swami Kriyananda a little crazy with all the questions I ask, so don't think that I take things really easily. But at a certain point, one becomes convinced, and if if all of this is demonstrably true to my experience, then I can go outside that box and figure that the same people who told me the truth that I can test are also telling me other truths. So when Yogananda talks about this line of masters and this whole um, divine force that has been sent to the world at this time, starting with Babaji and Jesus. Jesus is not part of it just because Yogananda was in America, but, you know, there, are, there is in the life of Christ what's known as the lost years. The Bible takes him up to the age of 13, and then he just basically disappears from view and then reappears when he's 30. Um, it's impossible to imagine that he never told anybody what he was doing during that period of time. And there's many verifiable um, beliefs that the Catholic Church just took those years right out of the Bible because what Yogananda said happened is that Jesus came to India and that he was connected to these masters and that he came to Babaji and that that's where he learned. And he did sadhana. But because Christianity is so confused, because they have no idea what an avatar or a self-realized master is. Jesus is the only son of God. They didn't even know what he meant when he said that. He's the only son of God. He just appeared out of nowhere. He saves us. Nobody else can save us. And the, the church decided, how could such a person ever do sadhana? How could he have ever gone anywhere and learned anything? So they just lifted it right out of the Bible. You know, it's convenient. If you're in charge and you own the whole thing, you can just do things like that. Now it's all coming out differently. But what Yogananda said is that Jesus came to India, and actually he spent much more time in India. He was here from the age of 13 or 14 until he was 30. Swami was talking recently about traveling to Or Orissa and going to the, te the Jagannath temple and talking to the priests. I haven't asked Swamiji where did all that information come from, but he was speaking of it. So he had a mission here. But the way Yogananda describes it, Jesus was responsible for the spiritual development of the West, Babaji and Master tells us that Babaji was Krishna in a previous incarnation. He, Yogananda always says, Babaji Krishna. 
I know that's a, you know, that's a big thought for the East. In, in the West, we just take it like, sure, why not? But here, I know it has more implications. But in a previous incarnation, he was Krishna, and then in this, at this cycle now, he's Babaji. But you have the power of Krishna, and you have the power of Christ, of Babaji, Krishna. And those are the two, when you think about it, those are the two spiritual forces. But it has to be renewed. This is what the Gita says, because virtue has declined, vice has, dom has predominated, the divine takes form again to renew it to, to, for this age, for this time, because what we're needing now is a practical, simple, into our own hands way of, of following spirituality. So the Kriya Yoga, which some of you started this morning to learn, some of you will come tomorrow to learn, it's very simple, really. It is, I will take responsibility for my own consciousness by my own effort in cooperation with the guru, because certain truths can't be. You can't just make up new truths. But we can apply our own willpower to it. Isn't that what life is about in this age? It's we're applying our own willpower to what we're doing. You know, the fam not, none of this is necessarily good, but it's still happening. Family structure is breaking down. Uh, coming up in the elevator, I was talking to this lady about all the countries her daughter has, has lived in and where she went to school. And I mean, I, everywhere I go, the families are scattered all across the world. Fortunately, we can travel back and forth and, and see each other. But nonetheless, everything is breaking down, and it's all coming out to our individual willpower. But that's the good news. Because now the responsibility for our spiritual life is right in our own hands. And we can affect our own consciousness by our own efforts. And this line of teaching is one of those that will help us to do it um, if, if we choose. And whether we choose to or not is entirely whether or not it, it appears to us that it's going to increase our bliss and lessen our pain. People in life, Yogananda wrote a book called uh, Science of Religion. Swami Kriyananda rewrote it. It's called God is for Everyone. It's on the table out there. It's a superb book. Very simple theory. This is when, before Yogananda came be, to America, he wrote, he had this very simple thought. He said, what is the essence of what I want to teach? Forget the gods and goddesses, forget everything. He said, there are two directions in human life and you know, one way we have, we suffer and we want to get away from the suffering. We feel pleasure or on a higher level happiness or on the highest level bliss. And we want more of that. And if you take, if you watch your life for one day, you will see that absolutely every decision is reflective of one or the other of those trends. Everything reduces itself down to those two points. And so then he taught change your consciousness, change your consciousness by scientific ancient methods of Kriya and other ways. You increase your bliss, you de decrease your suffering. So to find a path that, that pleases you and to follow it is just entirely dependent on how urgent the call within you is. And if you choose not to, and I mean, I'm not here recruiting you and I'm not gonna end by recruiting you or anything like that, if you choose not to, it's just because where you are in your life, you're content. You're not motivated. You know, we, I joke about this. There's two ways that we go forward. We go forward because we see something so beautiful, we rush toward it in life. You just see a beautiful vision of a, a life that you could have, or a relationship, or an artistic, and you, you run toward it. Or best of all, you feel the love of God, and you run toward it. Or else, you start burning from the back, right? You, you catch on fire from behind, and you move forward also very quickly, but it's because you're trying to escape something that's chasing you. And often in our lives, if we don't respond to the positive call, God sets us on fire from the behind, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and then one way or another, we move, okay? <laughs> Do you have any questions, comments, thoughts, anything else that you'd like me to speak of? Yes, my dear. Uh, you know, in America, uh, people are very sad. They're not very satisfied and all that, compared to, you know, uh -huh. in the Indian. I feel uh, in America, they're trying to express or they are able to express what their feelings are. Yeah. 
Indians are uh, not close minded, so they don't really express. So we also have people who appear to be satisfied, but really not satisfied in society. Absolutely, the truth. <laughs> But in America, they're able to express them, so that's what I feel. I think that misery is pretty even 50-50, so I put it. I feel that way, maybe. No, I don't no. Know. You're absolutely. Quantify the percentage. Yeah. I think this is a. No. I was quoting Mother Teresa only to say that there's other kinds of poverty besides material yeah, poverty. And, you know, it's very. Um, Americans, the individuality that gives us strength also isolates us. You know, many people live alone in a house. And, yeah. And at the same time, being an American, this is what I observe, because I have lots of Indian friends, both in this country and, and in where I am in California. Um, the commitment to the collective idea of what you're supposed to do, and I know that this will be very offensive to many of you, but people will tell me, well, my mother doesn't want me to follow this path. And to me, it's like, so? Like, what does that mean? You know, but, but it will be told to me with this force that, you know, you have, you have, no, under, you have no idea. To, to disregard my mother has a power that simply doesn't exist in the culture that I live in. So as a result of that, just what you're saying, that that development of individual awareness and of a clear understanding of who I am as an individual and what is really true to me gets suppressed. And I, I see it, the way I catch it is I get it when the women have been highly educated, I see it mostly among the women, they've been highly educated, you know, medical degrees, PhD degrees, and as soon as all that education is finished, they're married, they're, they have children, and they're trapped in an apartment somewhere in Silicon Valley, and they're going crazy. You know, because now suddenly, what are they really supposed to do with all of that? So I do understand. That's why they're practically, you know, well versed. That's why you said they're, they're practical, uh, you know, persons. So they experience themselves instead of taking advice from our elders. Well, the answer to all of it is a change of consciousness. You know, what's so fabulous is the answer to everything comes back down to we need to change consciousness. Individuals who find themselves trapped in circumstances, seemingly trapped in circumstances that they, they don't remember choosing. Tomorrow morning, the class is called Prosperity, but it's, it's a class about karma and magnetism and fate and destiny and how we change it. When we find ourselves in circumstances, but you see no one is born into an Indian body and into circumstances like that unless there's your perfect lesson. No one is born into an American body unless it's there's your perfect lesson. So it doesn't, that's what I was saying, it doesn't matter where you start, you find yourself as the accumulation of every single thing that happened to you and all your incarnations have brought you right to here. And it's brought you right to here because every perfect lesson is right in front of you. So then it just becomes a method, a question of what do I do about that? And it's not really, do I defy my mother? Do I you know, refuse to get married? Those are, those are trivial questions compared to what am I doing with my inner consciousness? This is what Swami Kriyananda has manifested of Yogananda's mission. What do I do with my consciousness? That was for me like, when I got that, when I was a young girl, wow, it's all about my consciousness. In my consciousness, I have some control over that. I felt suddenly, well, like I'd been given the mystic keys of awakening. This is what I'd been looking for. That all my circumstances were dependent on my inner consciousness and my inner consciousness was up to me. What freedom. And yeah, then there's the obstacles. And the obstacles are notable. I, I have a lot of respect for the obstacles. <laughs> so I don't, you know, I don't have a fantasy image of the Indian culture. We're, we're all in this together. There's a, there's a world of difference. <laughs> kids brought up in the U.S. and kids brought up here. They are all pampered lot. They won't do any of their work. They won't do their course. And then they will just uh, do everything parents are doing. So they are not sure that they will be able to manage. What they think is they are they have studied in the school or college, make some money, that is the life. Yeah. That is the way people they feel they say this is not the life. You have to manage if anybody going after graduation to US also they find difficult. Yeah. Because everything they have to do. Yeah. So they are trained that way. Yeah. So children are trained that way and they can take decisions. You know. If you are not trained that way, you are not prepared to take volunteer yourself and do any any work. Your ladies, they don't do homework. 
Yeah, yeah, the home maker is a great job. Yeah. They don't do. So, spirituality we only talk. We say God is there, he will look after, he will look after, he will look after. But we don't do. We envy everybody. We are going, trying only to see, I want to be like that, I want to have one more car like that. Right. Not to. We want to share. Yeah, my, right. my granddaughter is there. When she gets some insulting or what a school gives, she shares with the poor. There are so many poor people. And they, they don't even bread. Yeah. But they are all looked after very well by the government. They are given everything is fed to them. School, school is free, health is for those people free. But there are, as you said, there are plenty of uh, poor people there. Yeah. But, but one thing, we are very well, see, even weather is helpful to us. Weather, can we can go with the bunion here? You can't do that. So the, everything is against them, created country, and they have to manage. <coughs> they are not a white country, it's a total country of immigration. Yeah. Country of total immigration. Here we say our country, our country, but we want to do all this, we are head we hate another person. So this is very difficult, but for your uh, ideas are very good, but it will take a long time. Our scripture has said that. It, okay, um, I appreciate your passion. And I, I recognize it, and I can become quite passionate about things myself. So I, I respect it in others. <laughs> um, in the end, it's a question of individuals, because even though there is the whole society, everything changes one person at a time. And I am not registered to vote in America. I rarely read the newspapers. I don't know what's going on. But I consider myself intensely politically active because I spend my life teaching people to meditate. And, you know, one by one, you know, we, our destiny is individual. There's, there's global karma, there's um, national karma, there's city karma, but all of that is the background for individual destiny. It's two realities that play. We, we, we choose to manifest in a place, but then it's, it comes down to us. And this is Yogananda's solution. And this is the reality. This is where we walk. I, I can't affect global karma unless I first affect my personal karma. Swamiji mentioned on, at the program at Chennai, I mean, we're in Chennai, but at the music place, the music academy, he mentioned when the, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Unbelievably, in the middle of the disaster zone, there were two religious communities. Both of them, as it happened, were Catholic. One was a Jesuit, one was Franciscan. Everything around them was destroyed, and their place was not destroyed. I mean, there's no human logic that can say that, but they were in tune with another reality. So it's not only a question of you know, how you feel, it's also a question of, of truthfully, what's, what reality are you even living in? And I think at this time, and if enough of us, and we will, if the nation of self-realization gets stronger and stronger, however, whatever path you follow, just that shifting understanding will have a profound effect, at least on our own destiny and the destiny of the circle around us. It's the only possible way. Do we have any other thoughts or questions? Yes, sir. So all religions tell us that God created everything. Uh -huh. The favorite question of uh, atheists and agnostics is who created God? Who created God? Let me think for a minute. You know, Swamiji, um, I, write, uh, I, I write letters. I, people that send me questions and I write answers and it appears on a website. Um, if you look up Naya Swami Asha, you'll find it if you're interested. One of the questions was the big questions. Somebody wrote me a whole bunch of those questions, and I answered it at length. But let me answer it a little bit here. Swamiji says the, the only, let's see, how did he put it? The only thing that can't be defined in terms of anything else is consciousness, because consciousness is the foundation of everything. You can't define consciousness in terms of anything else. Um, what we speak of God, we're thinking of him or her or something like that. But the definition, the best definition of God is the word Satchitananda, which is ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss. And it, it just simply is. There is no 
cause behind that cause. The whole thought we have in our mind that this is caused by this, is caused by this, is caused by this, is because we live in this relative world. But once we enter into the, and this to me is words, not realization. I don't, I don't live in this reality. Once you enter into that, you recognize that this is the only reality there is and there's no cause behind that. Now, that's not a satisfactory answer because I'm not God realized, so I can't convey a consciousness. Um, but the closer one moves to that, the more it becomes obvious. You know, the, the, the way I think of it is this, and this is the way I answered when, in the letter that was sent to me. It's just not the biggest question in my mind when I get up in the morning. Because the question in my mind in the morning is, how can I serve others? And how can I experience bliss myself? And I can entertain myself with ideas like that, but they neither expand my own consciousness, my experience of bliss, nor do they necessarily uplift others. So at a certain point, and I know it's not really an answer, you just have to say, well, here's the other side of it. The answer to that question is meditate and do Kriya, or, or something like Kriya, because Vivekananda's answer. The state of consciousness that asks the question is incapable of understanding the answer, which I love that answer. That's my favorite of all answers. But in order then to understand the answer, you have to change your consciousness. And once you start changing your consciousness, then you understand it from a whole different point of view. Or you lose interest in the question because you recognize that what I am experiencing is the answer to that question. And that's a non-answer, but there you have it. <laughs> Best I can do. Is that the last question? Is that the last of the evening? Yes. What means Kriya Yoga to whether a yoga expert say again. is easy to achieve God? Would you say it one more time, please? I missed what, the beginning. What Kriya Yoga does, actually? What does Kriya do? What, what does Kriya uh -huh. Yoga uh -huh. do to one, oneself? Help, help to achieve. OK, this is the. And one more thing. Uh -huh. Whether a yoga expert. Uh -huh. Uh, can achieve God, or one person is away from yoga, he, he may not be able to achieve God. Well, let me answer sort of partly. I mean, I, I can't answer the question exactly as you asked it, so let me answer the question I think what you're asking. Yoga do? What binds us? Okay, what binds us to the state of consciousness that we're in is that we are identified first with our bodies and all that comes with that. The ego. Yogananda defined is the infinite soul identified with a particular body, whether that body is the astral body or the physical body, but we are the infinite, but we have become identified with this particular body. We haven't become it, we haven't ceased to be infinite, but we have defined ourselves by the, the reality that we live in. Tremendous amount, if you think about it, of your limited self-definition start with your body. I've been having a long conversation about being an American and all the ways that that's influenced me. My English is spoken differently than your English because I came in there. I'm a woman. I am of a certain age. I have a husband. Um, I have a whole bunch of things that are all, if you think about it, start with the body that I'm incarnated in. I'm not a particularly physically oriented person, but nonetheless, that has limited my self-definition because I have identified with this body. Um, one of the things that keeps me identified with this body is because in my chakras, up and down the spine, there are all these vrittis. And these vrittis are circulating energy around an, a central thought or desire or, or definition. I married my husband because I thought he was so adorable, I really wanted to marry him. In America, we can choose our own spouses. I, it was not free choice. I was powerfully drawn to him. It was a vritti in my spine. There was this thought of him, and there was all this energy circling around it. The desire to be healthy, the desire to be loved, the desire to be beautiful, the desire not to get old, the desire to be rich, to be a movie actress, whatever it is, we have this central point and then all this energy circulates around it. And it circulates for incarnations. It doesn't just do for one lifetime. You know, we're drawn. And those vrittis take up our energy and they hold us. 
and we overcome them by living through it. You know, I married this man that I love, I've had 30 wonderful years with him, and I have a much more relaxed and impersonal relationship to him. I don't love him less or admire him less, but a certain amount of the um, compulsion that, that characterized that, rela that relationship at the beginning has, I've, I've overcome it really to a large extent. I see it altogether differently. I'm not free. If I incarnate again and meet him again, I'm not, I'm not going to promise what's going to happen, but nonetheless, I think I'm wiser than I was when I started. So we learn things because we live through them. Um, this gentleman here has told me that he has a high-level profession, and I'm sure you had a desire to have it, and maybe you'll want it again, or maybe you've satisfied the desire to help people in a certain way. So you work out those, those vrittis, you, you resolve them. But there's a heck of a lot of them in there and uh, from lots of incarnations. And so to, all, they just keep compelling us to do things. That's the word I use. I don't really care whether I marry again or not, but I would like to not be compelled to do anything. I would not, have, not, not lose my center. I'd like to be able to stay centered. But those vrittis are forceful. What Kriya Yoga does, because, so that's the way we work them out. We live through them and we learn things. But if you could dissolve the vritti directly, because it's just energy, if you could dissolve the core thought that I am a man, I am a woman, I need this, I want that, and all that it is, it's not really the thing itself. This is very subtle. It's a vibration of consciousness based on a certain perception of reality of who I am, what's real, where does my happiness come from? Where does my pain come from? Every decision you make, every reaction you have in life is answering those questions in a certain way. I'm a physical body, something threatens my physical body, I get scared. Autobiography of a yogi, there's a story of a yogi where the policeman cut off the arm of this sadhu, thinking he was a, an evil man. The sadhu didn't even flinch. He just leaned over and picked up the arm and stuck it back on and healed it because he didn't think his body was real. He didn't think the body belonged to him. He didn't think the body could cause him pain because he answered those questions very differently. Okay? Now, we can dissolve those vrittis by, by raising our level of consciousness to the point where we perceive we answer differently. You have a deep experience of meditation, and you realize suddenly, you know, I don't need to smoke cigarettes, let's say. I don't need to have whiskey. I don't need to be married. I don't need to have money. And the vritti, if the meditation is strong enough, the vritti dissolves. And you never have to live through it. It just goes away. And so the whole technique of Kriya is circulating energy through the chakras concentrating energy at the spiritual eye so that those vrittis are dissolved by the force of what's going through. Let me give you one more image. If you ever have seen a river and how a river flows, and then whirlpools get started. You know, rocks will get stuck here. So the river's trying to flow this way, but some of it's stuck, right? Now, you can go in there and you can pull at the rocks and pull at the timbers and try to get it free, or you can just make the river flow stronger and stronger. Because if the river flows strong enough, it just sucks the vortex right into it. And what you're doing in Kriya is the river of upward moving energy is flowing stronger and stronger. And so just by doing that, the vrittis are just overwhelmed by it. And that's why Yogananda says that one Kriya, which is circulating energy through all the chakras and focusing it at the spiritual eye, is the equivalent to one year of right living. Because in one year, you'll experience karma. And, and if you live rightly, you won't make more. You'll overcome it. Or you increase the flow of the river. And it's, it's just a relationship. If you think of a whirlpool and the river, it's like whichever stronger, whichever one is stronger, the, the, is where the force goes. So you make this, which is really your impelling desire for God consciousness, stronger than this lingering desire to be famous as a piano player or whatever it might be. You just relative make the strength of this desire stronger and this is just gone. Which is why you just become somebody else. You just completely become somebody else. You don't even know how you do it. 
you just start doing Kriya, you start meditating seriously, and you don't even know where it went. But you just don't re react to life in the same way. And it's not that you go down or are suppressed. You're, you're literally free because those vortices are um, dissolved. Yoga, chitta, smriti, nirod. That's what Patanjali says. Yoga is the neutralization of the whirlpools of uh, feeling of consciousness. The vrittis are dissolved and the consciousness is unified with the divine. Does that make sense? It's like self hypnotism. I'm sorry? Self hypnotism? Oh no, not at all. Self hypnotism is just working with thought. This is actually working with the substance of your very consciousness. We are energy. We are energy in a state of vibration. Change the vibration and you've changed everything. This is not just ideas. No, no, this is not ideas. This is transformation. Completely different. Okay? Anything else? We're, oh, we're almost at the end of our time here. Is there anything else you would like to ask or comment on? Well, we kind of understanding to one's own self? I'm sorry, you have to say it again. How to be kind and understanding to one's own self? How do we come to understand one's own self? Kind. Be kind. How be, to be kind and understanding oh. to one's own self? Slowly by slowly, as you say in this country. <laughs> That's a very big project. I have a lot to say about it, but I don't think I can say about it now. We learn to see ourselves as God sees us. Um, when, we're too, when we're too engaged with ourselves, we get very confused. Um, we are so deeply loved by the divine that as we tune ourselves more to the divine, we become capable of looking back and seeing ourselves as God sees us. And we realize that all these things that we're so concerned about are just nothing compared to the, the true goodness that is our nature. Um, there is much more I could say. I'll say some of it tomorrow morning because there is a lot to say on that point. Most of the spiritual path is just letting go of wrong concept of self and allowing true concept to be there. We don't have to really, we don't really have to become anything we're not. We just have to stop identifying with the wrong part of ourselves. We identify so deeply with our limitations that we have become persuaded that's who we are. And then one day we realize that's not true because we dissolve the vrittis by the practice of Kriya and suddenly something else comes in. I speak from true experience, I promise you. I struggled for so long just at war with myself. And one day I realized, this is so dumb. <laughs> and I just, it just went away. But it was years of effort, I have to be honest with you. I just had to keep at it. And then finally, that samskar, that vritti dissolved, and I became someone else. And then you look back and you think, what could I have been thinking? But while you're there, it's very real. I'm very sympathetic. But it can end. All suffering ends. It's a happy ending. The story has a happy ending for all of us. <laughs> they do live happily ever after. They actually do, all of us, <laughs> eventually. Well, thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to share with you. Yeah.